Welcome to our Trinity Baptist Church worship service. We're glad to have you be a part. Uh, we thank God for each one of you. Our call to worship, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to, to give praise to your name, O Most High. We'll now have a selection from our praise team, and following that, Reverend Martin will come with scripture and prayer.
on the everlasting arms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're going to share with you right now from the scriptures of Luke, St. Luke 18, beginning at the second verse and all the way through the 13th. And we're going to stop at the 8th verse and do the 13th and go back from 9 through 12. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, To this end, men ought to always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city which, there was a judge in the city which feared not God, neither regarded men. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said unto himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming to me she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Surely, surely, and he shall, excuse me, and the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night within, though he bear long with them? I tell you the truth, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, the Son of Man will come. Shall he find faith on the earth? And so we will go to the book of Luke chapter 11 beginning at the fifth verse. And he said unto them, Which of you, having a friend, and shall go to him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is shut now and my children are with me in bed, I will not arise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not arise and give because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he will. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give unto you that ask of the Holy Spirit? So I say unto you, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open. For everyone that asks shall receive, and everyone that seeks shall find, and everyone that knock, the door shall be open. God bless you. Heavenly Father, we come in the name that is above every name, Jesus Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith, who is our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Holy Spirit, we all repent and ask of you to forgive us of all of our sins. Forgive us for how we walk too closely to the world. Forgive us for thinking too highly of ourselves. Forgive us for being indifferent of others. Forgive us for being proud and puffed up. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and cleanse us. Let us be more like that one who prayed. God, forgive me. I am a sinner. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, that you forgive us. Forgive the church of Jesus Christ. Forgive all of us for the things we left undone. Forgive us for the things we've done that we shouldn't have done. Have mercy on us. We lift up our leaders here in the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, and the United States of America, Father, that you would touch, that you would enlighten them through the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would receive a witness of truth. They would receive a witness of mercy. They would receive a witness of grace. They would receive a witness of truth, and that their light will come on in their mind and know what thus saith the Lord and that they would humble themselves and turn from their ways and trust in the true and living God. We thank you, Father, for our Trinity Baptist Church family. We thank you for the legacy that was left behind, that they sacrificed, that we are able to stand in this edifice today and praise and worship you this morning. 
We ask, O oh Lord, you give us a humble heart and a fervent spirit. Let this mind be in us that is also in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we lift up our governing officials that you would help them to see clearly the path they need to take. Help them to walk humbly in the path they need to walk. Let them be loving in the way that they do their work. And we faithfully give you the praise. And then, Father, we lift up our pastor this morning and his family, that you will continue to be with him as he prepares to bring the word. We ask, Father, that you would lighten his load and lift his fervent spirit, that he may proclaim the word of God, and the hearts and minds will hear and respond in kind. We faithfully give you the praise and honor and glory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. message in the music. God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light in our pathway. There's a message in the word for you. Good morning. Our second reading this morning will come from Paul's epistle to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and I will be reading verses 2 through Six, and then 7 through 10, closing out verses 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, 7 through 10, 16 through 18. 
The light of Christ's gospel is a message to all those listening and present this morning. Therefore, since we have this ministry, this ministry of reconciliation, the gospel, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not in forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Therefore, we do not lose heart, my brothers and sisters. Even though this, our outward man, is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction is only for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal the glass withers the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our god will stand through eternity let us pray Father, the late Billy Graham said these words, if America is to survive, we must elect more God-centered men and women to public office. If America is to survive, we must elect more God-centered men and women to public office. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this opportunity now to speak to you and pray for the leaders the government leaders of this city, this, this state, this nation, the world. Lord, allow me to intercede for our behalf of government this day in order for systems to change, oh God. The hearts of men and minds must change. For the problem of the heart is the heart of the problem. Oh God, thank you. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. So Lord, Hear thy prayer of thy servant this now. Lord, give us leaders who know how to cultivate the ground of this nation. Leaders who want to prepare our nation for the advancement of the kingdom of God and not their own name. Men and women who do not desire to be famous, but faithful, pursuing righteousness and justice with boldness and uncompromising adherence to your word. Leaders who will esteem you with humble and contrite spirits. Leaders who tremble at your word. Oh, Father, may our governmental leaders and authorities quickly obey your voice of instruction and leave fleshly wisdom and familiar crony counselors outside the camp, outside the White House, outside the office. Give them your anointing to increase their spiritual influence in the work in the political environment. May all political appointees ascend Capitol Hill and assume their offices with clean hands and a pure heart. 
Give them your light and your truth to lead us to the rock that is higher than I. Father, from the cross, Jesus cried these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. May we forgive those, O oh God, who have transgressed and stirred up and contaminated the waters that were once clean and pure and flowed from your throne into our land. Those who have taken, forgive them, O oh God, forgive them, those who have taken for themselves the best for themselves and, and trampled and despised the blessings that you have given each of us when you ordain this your great nation on that manifest destiny that all men are created equal. We the people, you say. Oh God, may we awaken and shake ourselves from the dust of their pollutants and sit once again in a dignified place, oh God. Oh God, when our ways please you, you will fight for us. And even our enemies must live at peace with us. We are said in your word, when a man's ways are pleasing to you, even his enemies will be at peace with him. Oh God, thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for leaders who carry your plumb line in their pockets so our foundation will be repaired and fortified and galvanized and mobilized and energized and our political offices will compromise and comprise the watchmen of this word. Watchmen of, from the Lord. Oh God, thank you for those who have been protesting and you've been strengthening them and galvanizing them and protecting them and leading them and strengthening them. Thank you for protecting them from the influences of the coronavirus and the sin of racism and xenophobiaism and hatred. Continue to press them on, oh God. Onward, forward, always and always forward. Raise up your righteous ones who are under your authority before they become a governing authority while in office. We ask you to keep them clear-minded, sober thinking, looking forward to the days of your visitation. Encourage your people that godly leaders are on the way as we resolutely separate the precious from the vile and return to you. Father, we thank you that you are moving in this land, purging the hearts of the sin of racism, the original sin. Continue to move and, and purge and cleanse this nation with the washing and regeneration of your word. Thank you, O oh God, that you're moving and you're returning and you're coming soon. O oh God, it was yours to call and ours to answer. May we finish well, but we will when we're finished. Empower Pastor Thompson now, O oh God, and empower Pastor to bring forth your truth uncompromising and may it align with your truth and the righteousness be aligned with the holy writ of your divine word. We love you and we thank you Holy Spirit for moving and empowering. Thank you in the name of Jesus the lion from the tribe of Judah, the deliverer and the redeemer, the scepter, the rose of Sharon. In Jesus mighty name we thank you. Amen. Amen. Empower these, your singers, your angels, your young people. Use them, oh God. All of them. Black, white. All of them. Thank you. Amen. Write the vision. Make it plain that they may run and not faint. Though the vision is only for a while, it shall speak and not lie. Do just what he said. Write the vision. Make it plain that they may run and not faint. Though the vision is only for a while, it's 
shall speak and not I. For if the Lord said, you can count on it, he will do just what he
to share with you today from the subject, Finding Common Ground. As we look at what's going on across our world, across the United States of America and other nations, there is a universal call for justice. In the United States, there's a call for a police reform. And we're looking at what can the church do, what can the church say uh, in these very difficult times. And we have an example in the scriptures of what the Lord says, and I'm going to share with you out of these verses that we hear uh, the Apostle Paul sharing with us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, and, uh, and also verse 17. And then we're going to look at an episode in the life of Jesus in John chapter 4, verse 9. So I'm going to read those three verses in your hearing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, and then 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and then John chapter 4, verse 9. And it reads, these are all from the New King James Version, and it reads, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings, uh, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So I want to talk about common ground, what we can do to find common ground. As we examine these scriptures today, we're going to look at what the Lord says to us through the sacred word about finding common ground. The Apostle Paul talks about the church having the ministry of reconciliation. And we want to look today at how we can have reconciliation, bringing uh, different sides together that we might be able to advance uh, our communities and advance the work of the church, uh, saying to our communities that the Lord still is at hand and that we have a God who is primarily interested in justice and interested in your soul being justly saved uh, for eternity. And so God is not just interested in temporary justice. He's interested in eternal justice. And eternal justice has to do with the state of our souls. But right now, we want to look at the state that we are in as we try to find common ground and look at what the Lord will say to us how the church, how his people, how the body of Christ should proceed during these very difficult times. Uh, these passages of scripture, as they have shared in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, that we are new creations and we are a part of the family of God. And God has given to his church, he has left us the legacy of reconciliation. And so I want to try to look up how we can, uh, how we can uh, find reconciliation as we have a, a passionate need for justice, and we want to be passionate about justice, but we also want to be Christian about justice. We want to make sure that we are honoring our Christ in all that we do. So the first thing I want you to hear is this passage in John chapter 4, uh, verse 9, where we find Jesus encountering this woman from Samaria. The scripture says that he was there at a well and he sat down at the well, and then this Samaritan woman comes. It was around 12 o'clock noon, it was high noon, it was hot, it was in the heat of the day, and this Samaritan woman comes, and she is, uh, has her utensils to draw water. And as she is approaching the well, uh, Jesus, who was a Jewish man, Jesus speaks to her and asks her for a drink. The woman says to Jesus, why are you asking me for a drink and you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan and Jews, she says, have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, please note her wording. She did not say Samaritans have no dealings with Jews. She said, Jews, you all don't have any dealings with us. You don't, you don't uh, embrace us. You don't have us as a part of your life. And so why are you asking me for water? 
I want to lift up a few things that will be helpful to us as Jesus uh, establishes what we can do to bring reconciliation. Now, you should also note that the Jews had been at a distance from the Samaritans for nearly a thousand years. This, what this woman is talking about was not a recent event. It had been this kind of uh, uh, segregation of their societies for many years, for, for centuries. And so now uh, when Jesus comes there, the woman is just saying to him uh, what everybody at that time already knew, and that was that the Jews and the Samaritans were segregated. Well, Jesus then does some things to help break down those walls of segregation. And I want to look at what we can do to break down those walls uh, that bring, that divide us and look at how we can be reconciled, what can happen to bring us together. And it's right here uh, in this text. The first thing I want you to know is Jesus establishes common ground. And so there's a need to establish common ground among us. And our common ground, particularly in the United States, the common ground would be our United States Constitution. That's part of our common ground. But Jesus, not, he doesn't reference the Constitution, but he does reference some things that will be common ground for his day. And one of the common grounds for his day is where he was uh, currently located. He was located in Samaria, but in Samaria, uh, they had uh, a well there that was known as Jacob's well. Now, this is an important part. Uh, this point is important because Jesus now, uh, the first thing he does to help uh, establish common ground is that he has himself in their place. He didn't ask them to come to the Jewish lands. He's actually in their place. He's walking in their shoes, and he is at their well, and that well was something they had in common because they both accepted uh, Jacob as their father. Uh, the Samaritans accepted Jacob as their father, and the Jews accepted Jacob as their father. And so they have this common ground of the well, and then they have the common ground of Jesus now is in their territory. He is in Samaria. He is uh, in their uh, place where they live. And so he, he's breaking common ground. He's, he's offering to them that, first of all, we have a common ancestor, and that is Jacob. And then he also recognizes that there are uh, some books of the Bible that the Samaritans accepted. They didn't accept all of the Bible. They didn't accept all of what the Jews were offering. But they did accept the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. And so he knew that he could reference the Pentateuch because that was a part of their belief system. And he knew that he could reference Jacob because Jacob was their father as Jacob was also the Jews' father. And so Jesus starts to establish this common ground. And I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, if we're going to uh, have peace in America and have justice in America, we got to establish common ground. Common ground would be that each person, each side, both sides have love for their family. Both sides have, uh, want to see how their families treated right. They want to see uh, the people that they care about treated right. And so that becomes our common ground. We want everybody to be treated right. We want police to be treated right. We want citizens to be treated right. We want immigrants to be treated right. We want everybody to be treated right. And that has to be a part of our common ground. And then the scripture also says, not only does he establish this common ground by being in that one place, but it also tells us that he speaks of, uh, and I'm gonna get to this in a little while, but he speaks of the woman's family. And family is a part of establishing common ground. Every one of us, every person you meet, every person you ever see comes from some family. Some people knew their family well, some people didn't know their family well, but they all come from some family, some place where they were brought up, some place where they lived. And Jesus now, uh, in this text, we're gonna see how he references uh, family. But here, he starts with this common ground of the place where they were and the ancestor that they shared, the history that they shared. And in America, we have a shared history, and we can start as being a part of that history, uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes uh, favoring one uh, racial group and not another. 
but it is our history and we want to move forward and build stronger bonds through the history that has brought us this far. And so here, common ground is what Jesus teaches us is that you want to uh, acknowledge where you are and then uh, don't be afraid of your history, but acknowledge it's just its true history. And history is something that you're, all, always, uh, you're always building on your history, and so it always is evolving. What we do today is a part of history on tomorrow. And so history is always evolving. And we get a say in how that history will evolve. We get a say in how that history will change. And Jesus teaches us here in this text that he now is starting to help change history by his actions uh, at this well with this woman. And so there he is at the well. It is at Jacob's well. And it is common ground for them. And so he's there and he speaks uh, He's there and he is present there. I want you to know he hasn't shared any words yet. He, his, just his very presence there speaks volumes of him being in Samaria at their well, which is also part of his well. And so he's, he's communicating without words first by his very presence there. And next thing we know is he communicates with words. There are some things he says, and I want to uh, offer the, uh, communication is the next thing. Uh, to find common ground, you need to be present. That's number one. And uh, fully recognizing the other person's presence as well. And then secondly, you need to offer communications. You need to share some things. And Jesus offers this a verbal communication by saying to this woman, give me a drink. When he says that, uh, the woman uh, who is, uh, she offers a protest. She says, Samaritan lives matter. Uh, Jesus says, I'm asking you for a drink. And the woman says, Samaritan lives matter. Jesus says, I, I need, I'm, I'm, I'm requesting a drink from you. And she says, Samaritan lives matter. And she's saying Samaritan lives matter because he, he was a Jew, although he didn't pronounce himself as a Jew. He didn't declare himself as a Jew. She just obviously saw by the way he carried himself and the way he was dressed she could tell that this man was a Jew, and she was saying that the Jews do not have any dealings with Samaritans. Samaritan lives do matter, but for you Jews, we don't matter. I, I'm a Samaritan. Samaritan lives matter. But for you Jews, you have no dealings with Samaritans. And when she says that, Jesus speaks to this woman, and it is important that we recognize he hears her protest. He hears that she says that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so now Jesus starts to do the exact thing that she said Jews didn't do. He starts to have dealings with her. He is communicating with her. He's talking with her. And my brothers and sisters, if we're going to find common ground, we're going to have to have some talk. We're going to have to be able to communicate with each other. We're going to have to be able to share some things. And that's what Jesus does. He opens up a conversation and he says to her, give me a drink. Now this is important because uh, he didn't have, as she points out to him, you don't have anything to draw water with. So if he's going to drink, he's got to drink from her cup. He has, to, he has to drink from a Samaritan cup. And Jesus, because he asked her for a drink, Jesus is saying to this woman, I know that you are Samaritan, and you've declared that. And I know that I'm in Samaria, but I'm asking this Samaritan to give me a drink, and that means that I want to put my Jewish lips to your Samaritan cup. My Jewish lips will identify and embrace your Samaritan cup. Jesus is saying, I'm offering common ground. What you drink from, I'll drink from. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be prejudiced. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say it's going to defile me. I'm not going to say it will. It will. It will injure me. I'm saying I'm going to take my Jewish lips and I'm going to drink from your Samaritan cup. All I need from you to do is be willing. Our Lord is breaking down barriers. He's breaking down the uh, sexual barriers. There was some sexual tension. Men you normally wouldn't speak to women at a well. And so he's breaking down those sexual 
uh, that sexual uh, barrier, those, those tensions between male and female, he's breaking those down. And it's important that we deal with sexual tensions. It's important that we recognize that all people, whether they are, are straight or gay, and I'm glad the Supreme Court recognized what it's done, it, it is to say everybody has a right. Everybody should be treated justly. I, I, I don't agree with everybody does, but I do agree everybody has the right to be treated justly. Male or female, whether they are lesbian or gay or transgender or queer, whatever they might be, they have a right to be treated justly. And that's what our Lord does with this woman. He says, I, I, I'm willing to put my Jewish lips to your Samaritan cup. Will you give me a drink? He recognizes that there are some racial tensions. Samaritan and Jew, those were different races. They, they were different ethnicities. And our Lord, he, he's, he's building a bridge across that racial divide by offering to her, I'm willing to, I'm willing to drink from your cup. And then he says to her, when she had not responded, he says to her, if you had asked me, I know I'm a Jew and I know you're a Samaritan, but if you had asked me, I would have given you living water. I, I, I would have I blessed your life just because you asked me. In spite, of your, in spite of our sexual differences, in spite of our racial differences, if you had asked me, and that's what our Lord wants us to see as the church, he wants us to see that when somebody asks, we need to be willing to help. You, you don't look at what you don't like about them or what's different about them or what's not the same as you about them. You look at how can I help? And this is what our Lord teaches us here. There, there were some sexual uh, tensions there. There were some racial tensions there. There were even some religious tensions there. Uh, she says to him, you know, you all don't believe in worshiping in this mountain. You believe that the only true worship is in Jerusalem, uh, Mount Zion. And Jesus says to her, uh, I, I, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to uh, raise up our differences. But he says, this is, this is the real trip. This is the real truth. The real truth is that the time is coming. And then, then look at verse 23. He says, the time is now. Now is the time when there will not be worship in this mountain or any other mountain. Now is the time when God's spirit will be worshiped in spirit and in truth. That, that, that's what God's trying to get us to. Whether you're Jew or Gentile or any other faith, God is trying to get us to God is a spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That, Jesus said, now is that time. Don't, 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 don't go back into yesterday and to all the different differences that we've had in the past. This is a new day. And he says in verse 23, now is the time. That's important for us to recognize that our Christ, he, he heals and he brings uh, those tensions that have existed between us. He brings those tensions down by saying, let's deal with where we are right now. Uh, don't keep bringing up what happened yesterday or in, in the past. Uh, let's look at what we can do now. It is, it is a, a significant verse, verse 23, that he says now. Not later on, not, not, in the, not in the future, but deal with it right now. Our churches need to respond now. Our churches need to stand up now. We need to stand for justice now, whether it be in a march, whether it be in a protest, whether, whether it be making a call to a senator or to a mayor or to a police chief. We need to make our voices heard now. That's what the Lord says. Uh, it is now is the time. And so Jesus deals with these uh, tensions. He deals with this uh, racial issue. He says to this woman, I'm willing to put, uh, I'm willing to put my, myself as a Jew, I'm putting my lips on this Samaritan cup because I want to deal with this right now. Well, as he tells her this, he then uh, asks her a question about her family. He asks her, to say, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a, a little more depth with you on this, but I need you to bring your family, bring, bring your husband. And then she says, I don't have a husband. 
Well, this is significant because now Jesus is making a, a connection where this woman isn't seen as being just by herself, but she's seen as being part of a family unit. And then she says, well, I don't have a family unit. I'm, 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 it's just me. And Jesus says to her, uh, well, you've spoken well because you, you are part of a family unit, but it's not where you belong. You, you've had husbands in the past, and the man that you're with now, you have rightly said, he is not yours. And it is important, my brothers and sisters, that we recognize that sometimes we make a decision to live wrong. We make a decision that even though it's not family, I'm going to pretend like it's family. I'm going to, I'm going to act like we're family when we haven't decided that we would actually be family. And the Lord says, says uh, you need to be aware of that. You need to, you need to uh, not, don't, do not continue to pretend when you know and everybody else around you knows that you haven't decided to make this family. And family is important. The Lord brings it up specifically for her to have to bring to her own mind that it is a right way and there is a wrong way uh, to be in family. And we need to choose the right way. And she knew the right way. Uh, she knew as having uh, established herself as being a Samaritan, Samaritans have, a, they have accepted the first five books of the Bible and the first five books of the Bible tell you how to be family. Her own belief system shared with her how to be family. And so she's violating her own belief system, and the Lord does not convict her of it. He just brings it to her mind. You just need to be aware. And he said, you've spoken well. You've told the truth. The man you're with now is not your man. He is not part of your family. And that's, uh, you just need to be aware of that. And the Lord doesn't say anything else about it. He didn't tell her, well, you ought to get out of there. He doesn't tell her, uh, you need to uh, make some changes. He just simply says, you have spoken the truth. And once you speak the truth to yourself, not somebody else, not, not me preaching it to you, once you say it to yourself, then you have a responsibility to respond to that truth. You don't have to respond to my truth. But you do have to respond to the truth that God sends into your life and it's in your heart, it's in your conscience, and it comes out of your mouth. Respond to that truth. If you see that things are not being just and right, you need to respond to that truth. If, if you see that everything isn't great as it should be, then respond to that truth. Well, here Jesus says, this woman, uh, you have spoken well. Let me get to the last thing I want to lift up today. Uh, I've shared with you, number one, that Jesus' very presence there at the well, he was in that territory, and he's walking in their shoes. And when you're dealing with people that feel uh, uh, misused, you feel uh, that they haven't gotten justice, uh, it's, impor it's important and right to walk in their shoes. Uh, don't judge them, and you haven't walked in their shoes. Don't, don't say that they're wrong, and you haven't walked in their shoes. Jesus actually comes into Samaritan territory, and when you read the text, it actually says, he says to his disciples, we must, I need to go through Samaria. I, I have to do this. It is, uh, it is something I am compelled to do. I cannot not do this. I have to get this done. He had to go to Samaria because this was something that needed to be addressed, and it's something that we also need to address in our time. And so it's something we must do. It must be present. And then secondly, it must be communication. Uh, and third, we need to deal with the tensions, the tensions that uh, whether it be male or female, or whether it be uh, straight or gay, uh, whatever the tensions might be, uh, deal with those tensions. And then he dealt with the racial issue by saying there, I'm willing to put my Jewish lips on your Samaritan cup because I want to say I identify with who you are and I'm not afraid to be a part of who you are. Our Christ identifies with us. But then let me close by saying the last things that we have here uh, as we look at how Jesus uh, deals uh, with, these, with this situation. I want to share some, some good news that happens. Uh, she opens up by saying that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
Well, this episode closes. Uh, the woman goes into town, and I should note just kind of parenthetically that uh, the disciples had gone into town and they had gotten Jesus some food and brought food back. And uh, they came back, 11 of them went in and 11 of them came back. They didn't bring anybody with them. All 11 of them went and all 11 of them came back and not one other person came with them. When this woman goes into town, that's this one woman, when she goes in, she brings the whole town back. The, the Bible says the whole town came back out to where Jesus was. She, brought, she says to them, uh, come see a man that has told me everything about me. Uh, and she says, I believe he is the Christ. I believe he may be, she says, he may be the Christ. He may be the Messiah. And so they come out. The whole town comes out. And they confer with Jesus. They talk with Jesus. They, they hear what he has to say. And it is a good thing, my brothers and sisters, when we see when Jesus had to say, as that whole town came out, the Bible says that they were so uh, blessed by his presence that they asked him to stay with them. They asked him, these, these uh, Samaritans who have nothing to do with Jews and Jews who have nothing to do with Samaritans, they asked Jesus, will you stay with us? The Bible says Jesus stayed with them two days. They asked, and he said uh, he consented to stay. And not only does Jesus stay, uh, his other 11 disciples stay. Now, I can assure you that uh, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't their plan. I can assure you that, that they, they, didn't, they wasn't feeling comfortable there. And sometimes you got to put yourself in a position where you may not feel comfortable. Sometimes you got to put yourself in a position where if you're going to bring healing, healing is not always comfortable. If you ever had to have surgery, uh, the surgeon usually has to do some cutting, some other things, and, and that's never comfortable. And you have to heal before you start feeling the benefits of, of the surgery that you had because initially it's not comfortable. It is to bring healing so that you'll be better after the surgery than you were before, but the surgery itself is, is never comfortable. And so when Jesus stays there, he's staying there with his disciples, and they are, they are, are, are not in a position of being comfortable, but they knew that what they were doing was right. And so as long as you're doing what's right, you don't have to be comfortable. You just need to be right. Our Lord challenges us to move out of our comfort zone and to do what we know is right. It may not be comfortable. In fact, I can promise you initially, it will not be comfortable. Every, I've been to three protests and three marches in the last few weeks, and, and none of them were comfortable for me. But I knew it was right. You stand for what you know is right. That's what our Lord teaches. And that's where, that's where the possibility of healing comes. That's where the possibility of us being whole, America being uh, the great nation God is calling it to be. It comes through us being willing to be uncomfortable, standing for what we know is right. And I close by saying we know, the church knows, that our Christ is right. Our church knows the way of Jesus Christ is the right way. When we follow Christ, we're doing what is right. We may not be doing what's popular. You will get uh, people used to uh, almost want to tease Christians for uh, bending down on their knees. Now that this police officer has killed George Floyd by bending on the knee, we're starting to recognize now that our God is able to, if we will use that symbol of bending on the knee, as, as Colin Kaepernick did, if we we'll use that symbol to call on the power of God, he'll bring healing to us. He'll help us. Our foremothers and forefathers used to say, we need to spend some time on our knees asking our God to change us and to help us and to guide us and deliver us. Our Christ shows us the way. And my brothers and sisters, I just want to close by offering you Jesus Christ. He is the way. Amen.
falling in love with Jesus, falling in love with Jesus, falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, I've ever arms never disconnected in his arms I feel protected there's no place I'd rather rather be oh falling in love with Jesus I'd rather, rather be